The goal of the legis this legislation, S77, uh, patient choice and control at the end of life, is to allow dying Vermonters more autonomy and more control in their final days. It allows them to participate in their deaths on their own terms, much in the way they, we like to live our lives. <coughs> um, they can involve their families, they can take comfort that their suffering will end quickly. They can create a harmonious, loving, peaceful passage at the end of their lives. It ensures that anyone seeking this option doesn't have to die alone, and that everyone who participates in this option is on a solid, legal, uh, and medical basis. It's a bill to bring more choice and control to mentally competent, terminally ill Vermonters as they face and embrace the last days of their lives, the final stages of the dying process. One goal of this legislation is to provide terminally ill patients and their medical providers a safe harbor in the law so that patient-directed dying can become an option available among the full, option, full spectrum of options for Vermonters and our end-of-life choices. It uh, came forward with a proven track record. We modeled it on the Oregon uh, law that had 15 years of extensive data collection and analysis by numbers of groups and people on both sides of the issue. And it included, originally, important safeguards for patients. It's important to emphasize at the outset that uh, S77 doesn't ask us to choose between good hospice and palliative care or physician aid and dying. It offers us both. Um, this is enabling legislation. It gives us permission to use this option. And it is not, uh, no one needs to participate in this if they have public, um, objections to it. No health care providers need to participate. There's no requirement for that at all. So, um, we, in Vermont, we have been working on improving our end-of-life choices, We've got, but we still have a lot of room to improve, and these are the two of the committees in the House that have worked the hardest on those efforts. Um, while hospice for our referrals, for example, have increased 50% in the last 10 years, we still rank in the take-up rate how many people who die in Vermont and use hospice on the lower half of the United States. We could do a lot better in hospice care. And part of that has to do with the conversation that takes place when people learn that they're dying. In recent years, we have promoted advanced directives for Vermonters and worked with health care providers on clinical orders for life-sustaining treatment. Both of those are, um, are things that we do when we're, ideally when we're well, to talk about what our options might be and how we'd like to be treated at the end of our time in hospital and at home and under emergency circumstances. The goal of that work has been to get people to start the conversation about end-of-life coverage or end-of-life care and to improve the options that we have. We've worked with insurance companies to offer more coverage for hospice and palliative care. And as a state, we've requested that the federal government offer enhanced hospice benefits. We've been working on it. We still have a long way to go, but it's really important. We've also mandated that um, medical providers have are required to take uh, courses in palliative care and pain management. Hospice care is now available in every corner of the state. And these efforts are important. We will continue them, but we believe S77, we believe S77 could be a catalyst for more improvements. That was the experience in Oregon. So I guess an important part of this conversation is to understand what the options are right now. These, we, this is what we were looking at when we came up with S77. Um, right now, uh, Vermonters who face terrible pain and suffering or unbearable loss of autonomy have several options that are um, currently available. None of them are pain-free, none of them are easy decisions, but they are available. A dying pa uh, patient or his or her surrogate may choose to cease eating or drinking. They can refuse <coughs> treatment. A person can request uh, medical treatment and life-sustaining medical devices be stopped or disconnected. They could uh, request terminal sedation, which is also known as palliative sedation. So I'll talk a little bit about what those are like. A person who stops eating or drinking um, will eventually starve or dehydrate to death. And depending on um, the, the, the state that they are in, what, where they are in their illness, their underlying treatment <coughs> they can take days or weeks. In some cases, that's an active decision. A physician has to order that an IV be discontinued or a feeding to be discontinued. Or in some patients, or some case, cases, people just make that decision and simply stop 
eating or drinking. <coughs> Doctors who specialize in end of life treatment say it's not, it's not the worst way to go. Um, patients can refuse, or their surrogates can refuse, new or additional medical treatment um, that might prolong life as well as. Uh, <coughs> That might prolong life, but that can be a complicated choice because we're all, most people want to live. We don't know if that next treatment, that next pill, that next IV could really help us turn the corner. It's a, it's a very complicated choice for a patient and these are a family to make. Um, people can request termination of life support or the deactivation of medical devices. Um, those require an order written by a physician, of course. Death or the end of suffering may be soon, as in the case of unplugging a ventilator or uh, turning off the digger or turning off the pacemaker. <coughs> or it may take a few days in the case of turn, uh, discontinuing dialysis or IV treatment of some sort. And the final choice, and these are all acceptable practices today by most religions and medical places. The final choice is a pallias, palliative sedation, and that occurs at a patient's request or, or, or surrogate in case of lack of competency. The doses of drugs, and this, the, the idea behind it is that uh, usually the pain or suffering is un, can't be controlled by medication. So the idea is we make the patient unconscious and they no longer suffer. Whether or not they suffer is a matter of medical question. It's not agreed by everybody that that's the case. The doses of drugs, this is a high intervention method. Doctors have to very carefully titrate the doses of drugs required to keep the patient unconscious and they monitor and administer it until the patient dies. While the patient is under this medication, there are no, uh, there's no food or drink offered. It can take, uh, it can take varying lengths of time. Um, patients may stay in a coma for weeks. It can be heart-wrenching, and it's something that uh, a lot of people, that doesn't appeal to a lot of people because of the lack of As I said, these options are accepted by most uh, medical communities and most religious communities and their people. But for many, many Vermonters, starvation and unconsciousness are not approaches that, um, that fulfill their need to have some control over what the end of their life looks like. Remember, these are people who are already dying. They're not choosing death. Death has already chosen them, and they're trying to have some control over what those last few days look like. They want more autonomy. They want more control. And they want more choices than the current options. In essence, they want an option that allows them to personally control, to the extent that anyone can, the timing and character of their natural <coughs> and approaching death. Some will tell you that terminally ill Vermonters can already secure medication from a sympathetic doctor, their friend or their neighbor or their relative, to control the timing of their death. But medical providers will tell you that they risk their license and are exposed to threats of lawsuits and criminal jeopardy when they do this. This under-the-table option is only available to a few and is completely <coughs> lacking in safeguards. There's no one to check if you're depressed and, and some medication might make you feel a lot better. There's no one checking to make sure you really do have a terminal diagnosis. This is a one-on-one -on -one <coughs> favor that people may do in certain cases. Others say a terminally ill patient can take his own life. Regardless, regardless of the law, but um, how unfortunate is it that our laws provide Vermonters with just these two choices? If they involve their family or friends, they expose them to possible criminal investigations or possible criminal charges. If you're there when your spouse or loved one takes an overdose or something, you could be involved legally. Or they take action alone without their loved ones and without being able to say that final goodbye. No one should be forced to die alone. We had eloquent testimony on just that subject um, from uh, Mrs. Uh, Mallory, Mallory's wife, who talked about the circumstances under which her husband died. Excellent. So you, you will hear that. So the um, path of S77 was um, rather unusual. We created a, a committee bill. It passed out of... Um, Senate Health and Welfare on a 5-0 vote, and the bill was referred to judiciary. And by prior agreement, uh, which is also unusual in the Senate, we, and not the prior agreement, but that is a little bit unusual, but we had agreed in advance that we would do the unusual thing and have our judiciary voted out on an adverse vote. They would recommend against it, which they did on a 3-2 vote. So the first question on the Senate floor 
was whether to endorse the Senate Judiciary's recommendation to reject the bill. It's a little complicated. So the first thing we voted on was whether or not to reject the bill. And I'm trying to give you a sense of the sense of the Senate. So that bill, that vote, that failed on a 13-17 vote. And we, um, we, reject, we rejected the, the um, recommendation of Senate Judiciary. And we got to present the bill, the underlying bill, the original bill, S-77. We had several hours of uh, questions and debate on the floor about the issues. And most of that, <coughs> most of the questions centered on the safeguards of the bill. The safeguards for patients, not the safeguards for health care providers. Were, you know, were, were people, certain groups of people were more vulnerable? Might they feel pressure to end their lives prematurely because of, of uh, financial issues or insurance it, issues? I'm sorry, if we're going to be hearing about the original bill, I, I would really want a copy. We don't have copies of that. So if you're going to be discussing specifics about the other bill, mm -hmm. not what was passed, I, I really would want yeah. copies to well, follow along. I think you're going to get to what I am. I, I, I guess I, it, it was such a torturous path to get to the bill that we finally got to. I guess I was trying to describe how, the process to get to the bill. But <coughs> that's fine. But you're gonna, you were yeah. starting to oh, talk okay. about identifying safeguards. Okay. And if we're going to talk about it, I'd like to have that okay. in front of me. These okay. are the okay. issues that were raised on the floor uh, in opposition <coughs> to the bill. And um, okay. we, will, we will ensure that there are copies for which bill are we going to act on? Um, we're, we're going to have a discussion. I don't know. Right now, we're getting testimony from. But she hasn't mentioned anything about like this. So I have a she's, getting this. she's getting it. She's getting it. Okay, committee, let's see. I'm getting Let's fill and let her. Okay. Continue. So we had a long extended debate over the, the bill and um, had some amendments on the floor. And uh, a <coughs> before we wanted to move it to third reading, uh, a third, a second amendment was proposed by Senator Charbonne Galbraith, and um, it was it was passed on a 15-15 vote. The Senate was tied on this, and the, the Lieutenant Governor, the President of the Senate, made cast the deciding vote that we would substitute the amendment, which is the basis for the incentive that we have before you. Um, and we proceeded from there. Third reading was ordered on a 21-9 vote. And in the end of that, there was a final amendment, which really changed the character of the bill and made it a better bill, but I don't believe reflected the, there wasn't any unanimous, there wasn't any overwhelming um, consensus that we, because of the 15-15 vote, it indicates to me that the Senate really did not have an easy time with it. So this was, the result of the amendment that followed. The language that you have in S-77 was characterized by one of the sponsors as uh, in support of one of the, meth, one of the um, options available to some Vermonters right now that we call the wink wink nod nod method here to trying to help you out. Um, but this would support that and not accept the system that would continue something that was available to Vermonters today, a sponsor um, said. We had no testimony on the bill that we have, we have in front of you. Very little more discussion, and certainly no witnesses to um, support the bill. <coughs> so, Madam Chair, do you have, Mr. Chair, do you have a copies of S77 as passed by? Yes. Okay. The only thing this bill does is provide, the one thing that this bill does is provide protection for doctors who prescribe for a certain and for their families or loved ones who are present when they die. Uh, we had testimony about how the kinds of, how the kinds of prescriptions that are given to help to assist people in, in when they're planning their deaths, what those kind of prescriptions look like. And our witnesses would disagree that this bill accomplishes that. Would you like me to discuss what we heard from our witnesses that addresses this as 77? 
Yes. <laughs> this S77 says that um, a doctor who prescribes medication to that patient for the relief of symptoms associated with the illness shall not be subject to criminal or civil liability or professional or professional disciplinary action if the patient self-administers more than the prescribed dosage of the medication and dies as a result. Because there's no testimony, there was no testimony, it's understandable that um, the how how people are medicated at the other end of their lives for, for a lot of pain is misunderstood. And what we were told by our doctors that um, we were advised that this was not the way to, to phrase any of, any of the language in the world because patients who are on medication for lots and lots of pain develop an amazing tolerance. As you probably know from your discussions of the opiate industry, you can, you, a, the baseline medication for one person who's been suffering for quite a long time and has a lot of pain would be enough to knock over a large farm in practically. It's just, I, I say that, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be a joke, I take it back. It um, would be, would, could be a lethal dose for someone who'd never, who'd never taken opiates. So to say, and, and in hospital situations and in terminal care, our doctors told us that they prescribe in small amounts for a number of reasons. One is to, um, to lessen the chance of diversion of, of regulated drugs, and the other is to lessen the chance of accidental overdose. So, the, but the dose that it would take for someone to end their lives at the time of their choosing is, is not something that's easily calculated when you've been on very high doses of opioids. It would be very easy in these circumstances to take enough to make you really sick to put your family in a, a terrible position of not knowing if they should call the hospital or, or whatever. They, they really wouldn't know how to deal with this kind of situation. What happens in Oregon when people in this kind of situation were on long-term opiate or pain relief? They were usually given something given some called barbiturates. It's what we used to know as speed of barbital and those kinds of drugs. They're not given very much anymore for, for lots of reasons. and. Um, because these people wouldn't have uh, a resistance built up to them. That's the kind of drug that's given to people when they want to make end-of-life decisions. It's um, <coughs> given in a, uh, an amount that's easy to, to ingest, a small, it's a physically a small amount, but it acts in concert with the drugs that they're on. The idea that people can just uh, take prescribed medications, take more than they want, and they will somehow have the the result that they want is um, not based on good medical information. Doctors who who um, prescribe barbiturates as, as routine care for diseases would not be considered as routine um, as for relief of symptoms would not be working within standard practices. Barbiturates are not given for relief of symptoms for terminal diseases, generally speaking. So this really wouldn't do uh, most people 